I want to make three points, um, which could be opened into three different lectures, but we don't need it now because essentially the background of um, identity, uh, state traditions, the merging of various traditions, and so on, uh, I have, I uh, hope, uh, given enough of a background. But I want to basically summarize now to uh, open uh, the discussion is what happens when the Ottoman power is consolidated after it expands uh, to the Danubian Europe. The, very briefly, uh, the European, uh, the rise of an image in in Europe, and how that image changed is my second point. In Europe, with the Enlightenment, and to what extent it changed, and then how Turkish perception of Europe changed at the decline of the Ottoman Empire. I'm not going to spend much time on these because these issues are usually discussed. But what I want to point to wrap this discussion up is to show some of the uh, important, what I think significant aspects of uh, perceptions and realpolitik uh, that uh, is not uh, adequately treated in respect to this uh, Turk Turkey or Turk Turks and Europe issue. One is that the move towards the uh, the uh, Danubian Europe, of course, gave rise to the image of the terrible Turk, it had a huge impact. It had a huge impact, as I sent in my summary, just to repeat that uh, in, a, in a book on the history of a newspaper, Flugblatt und Zeitung, in the 20s, a German scholar uh, trace the origin of broadside daily papers to the Turkish invasions of uh, Central Europe because the German burger was uh, wanted news of <laughs> where the Turks were coming. And uh, there was a Turkish Steuer in many cities um, to uh, raise funds for defense and uh, particularly bells ringing for alarm, Türken Glocken in many, many places. That, of course, raised the uh, image of the terrible Turk, but the image of the terrible Turk was interpreted many different ways. And some of them uh, basically saw the Turk as a great threat to the entirety of Europe and Christendom. There were others who said, well, we deserved it, uh, and the Turk is sent as a punishment of Christendom for its sins by God. Um, so that, was, that was also a, um, uh, very much of a discussion. What I want to bring to light without, many, uh, without any examples is uh, that while the image of the terrible Turk was uh, here, there was very little of that in uh, Italy uh, and in the borderlands. Uh, the borderlands had to deal with the immediate Turkish peril, so uh, ambassador like uh, Ogier Gislain de Busbeck as the first very objective uh, uh, 
description of the uh, government and the military organization of the Turk because this was a reality to them. It was not a, a mythology. It was also a reality because Venice was very much involved in trade, so you do not have the, um, this uh, uh, mythologizing the Turkish peril, but actually uh, describing the, the uh, Turkish peril. Now, the, what did Enlightenment bring to that? The Enlightenment, on, on which the Enlightenment and the Turk, uh, in terms of perception of the Turk, um, I've written before, and uh, maybe it should, uh, that was a very long time ago, um, very simple, but a, um, a, a theme and a topic that is, that is often missed. The Enlightenment, um, one of the most important contributions of the Enlightenment is empiricism. I mean, you go from speculation to observing and recording. That is essentially the, the scientific basis of enlightenment. So, the scientific basis of enlightenment was very much the recording of what is going on in the Ottoman territories. Not only with respect to uh, the Turks and the way the Turks uh, run things, but from the mid-17th century on, particularly French travelers coming and recording the flora and fauna. I mean, uh, uh, Tavernier drew 3,000 3, kinds of uh, description and, and drawings of uh, uh, plants that uh, were indigenous in, in this area. So, in fact, in summary, what the Enlightenment contributed was the mythologization of the Turk. But we still have uh, the image of terrible Turk uh, because it is a very strong image that has come down and it uh, ri uh, raises its head in contemporary uh, situations as well. That, that is there. Uh, uh, German fairy tales and uh, children's tales of woods, they're there too. Uh, Germans are fascinated with forests. Uh, there is no reason why that should be forgotten. But, and there is no reason why that image of terrible Turk, which is an uh, it's, it's a fascinating image, it's, it's there. But essentially, that is no longer <coughs> being uh, replicated and uh, manufactured from the uh, end of the 18th century. That does not mean, however, that there is a corresponding uh, sympathy or warmth towards the Turk. That is not the case. That is a personal reaction. You have, on the one hand, uh, Lady Montague, uh, early in the uh, uh, 18th century. Her letters are uh, a record of what was happening. She was the wife of the uh, uh, British ambassador after the uh, Turkish defeat in Petr Varadin, uh, lived there for uh, briefly, uh, she could have lived there uh, longer had her husband not been such a fool uh, and an inept ambassador that he was recalled. Uh, <laughs> that is the reason why she couldn't spend more time there. Um, but at the same time, Lady Montague was a literary figure. Uh, half of her, well, a significant part of her correspondence was with Alexander Pope, the uh, famous poet of the Augustan period, and so on and so forth. Yet, Dr. Johnson, who was also a little later, but of the same group, Dr. Johnson said, well, 
Turks are barbarous people about which uh, nobody should bother to write. Ah, okay, these are... Uh, uh, so, uh, enlightenment, recording, but, uh, but uh, certainly does not change ingrained attitudes of certain people are uh, uh, subscribed to those attitudes. That is the unimportant aspect. What is the important aspect is that the Enlightenment period is also the period in which the Turkish menace is no longer looming large. In other words, I just mentioned Peter Varadin was the loss of Belgrade. Uh, ended with the loss of Belgrade. We're not talking about the new in Europe anymore. Though the uh, Belgrade, the uh, the Ottomans conquered uh, a few years later, but that was that was it. Turkish power was waning. From uh, this to the 19th century, uh, let me point out one aspect in terms of an overall to change the European attitude. In the 18th century, there is the essential thing, whether you like something or not, there is a reason for everything. Uh, in other words, you record and try to understand the reason. The extreme uh, uh, case for this enlightenment uh, optimism is was made fun of by Voltaire and Candide, where <clears throat> uh, that uh, very short novella is, uh, is a hilarious uh, thing of, of uh, making fun of uh, German. Uh, enlightenment thinker Leibniz and it's clock that everything is working well and they have shipwreck and always oh, the best of all possible worlds and so on and so forth. So there's this enlightenment view uh, came to be criticized because essentially there is uh, little reason to be all that um, uh, uh, optimistic uh, about everything. But in that Enlightenment view, things have an essential order and reason. And therefore, the way in which there was rule center institutions here uh, were described, whether they were uh, interesting, according to some, whether they were sophisticated according to others, whether they were really bad according to others. Well, but there's description. And in that, there is also a hierarchy that several of the Enlightenment travelers um, uh, mention uh, and, in fact, emphasize. And that Christian minorities, Greeks, and so on, they are considered even worse than the Turk because they are lower in the hierarchy of uh, the Ottoman order. Now, I haven't seen any discussion of this in terms of uh, European attitudes towards uh, neighborhood hierarchies or foreign hierarchies, but 18th century definitely uh, put the, uh, the, the Greeks, as uh, Greeks particularly, because they had more contact with the Greeks, they, the ships came this way and then, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, worse. From 18th to 19th century, of course, following from the age of reason to the romantic became, this notion became just the opposite. It turned around because then the Ottomans became, if 
from the Greek independence on, remember Byron and so on and so forth, that the Ottomans became oppressors of Christianity. So the time of the Enlightenment, the Romanticism, uh, Turks, the as the uh, uh, threat to Europe is no longer important, but Turks become oppressors of uh, the, the Christians, and consequently, uh, the Romantic period and later, there is the Balkan nationalism was against the Ottomans was uh, supported very largely, but not by everyone. And that is, of course, the uh, uh, paradox, because on the one hand, you have Byron. On the other hand, you have the Congress of Vienna. And the Congress of Vienna essentially wanted to end, again, wars, with regard to domination by one or two powers of Europe. It was Congress of Vienna is essentially to remedy the situation so that there is no other Napoleon. And if you want to have a, a guarantee of balance of power, that's why Kissinger wrote his dissertation uh, on this, you have balance of power, you make sure that England plays the role of a wild card so that the other four are not, uh, cannot get into a coalition to crush one or two of the others. <coughs> so that is not enough. The biggest threat to Turkey became no longer Europe, but Russia. Russia's long-term ambition to get a foothold in the warm waters of the Mediterranean. They expanded the base now, so everyone's happy. But it has a history of three centuries of Russia trying to get there. But England and France didn't want that. So consequently, the <coughs> paradox is that Turkey had to be, after the Crimean War, supporting Turkey against Russian uh, ambition to reach the Mediterranean. Uh, Turkey, <coughs> Turkey was brought in as one of the, uh, as the seventh great power uh, into the European concert. That European concert uh, was essentially to, if you constrain <coughs> Russia from playing havoc here, you try to constrain Russia by uh, reaching Suez, therefore frustrating French and particularly British ambitions uh, in east of Suez and in the Mediterranean. Two final sentences with this situation. Um, the <coughs> the end of the Ottoman Empire really, I mean, the uh, legally and internationally, the end came after the First World War. But the end of the Ottoman Empire really came in 1881. The Turco-Russian War of 77, uh, 1877, 78, the armistice was signed where Istanbul International Airport is. The Russian army <laughs> were there. And of course, everyone intervened and uh, Russians were uh, the uh, uh, Treaty of uh, Conference in Berlin, where it's back. Uh, Bulgaria is uh, uh, Bul 
Hungarian gained its independence later in the Balkan War. So, I mean, uh, up to the Danube, um, the, um, the Ottomans were given back the uh, territory. But the empire owed so much that in 1881, uh, a national debt administration was established. National debt administration was that the British and uh, French bankers moved in to manage the entire resources, minerals, uh, uh, and uh, tobacco, uh, uh, etc., of the empire, but also the Ottoman bank, which is 50% British, 50% uh, French, um, gained the authority to print banknotes. So essentially the state was gone. Uh, my second sentence is that how did Turkish uh, uh, outlook or perception of Europe? The Turks had been, since the beginning of their defeats in the early 18th century, had come to realize that they had to learn from Europe in order to uh, stand up to Europe. So uh, Turkey embarked on a course of defensive westernization. The implication of this defensive westernization was two things. One is that you are learning from Europe, but essentially to stand up against Europe. So there is a paradox in uh, the Ottoman westernization. Number two is, uh, number two is uh, the Turkish view of what will you take from Europe? It's essentially, there is an agreement there that you are different from Europe. So you will only take things that are applicable as the Sultan's uh, uh, Grand Vizier's decree uh, to the first ambassador is. Take means of civilization that are applicable. So the implication of that for um, uh, the relations of um, uh, Turkey with Europe today uh, an earlier uh, uh, period of um, application for membership is there that it is not only Europe says you're different, but there is a message strongly coming from Turkey, uh, not a negating message, but an essentially an admission that we are different too. Um, this is something that perhaps is not so important to know for Europeans, but I think uh, uh, Turkish uh, decision makers, uh, diplomats, and uh, policy makers, and academics should know about it, that Turkey has been sending this message that we are, we are different. Uh, so that in that, there is this notion of selective borrowing, that you can take certain things uh, from European uh, cultural and technological arena as if you're shopping in a supermarket. And that is one of the main problems because you cannot take institutions out of their political and cultural context. Uh, you cannot. And that has not been adequately discussed, which I uh, would want to bring uh, to your attention. Altogether, uh, to sum up what this discussion uh, contributes uh, to uh, the discussion of future of Europe, is that I hope I gave you some notion that um, the, there are fault lines in Europe. Uh, it is, the fault lines are many. And the, a, a better design for the future of Europe would
come with the taking into consideration these fault lines and how a Europe could be constructed with the full understanding that these fault lines are, that, uh, are there. It's not only between uh, Turkey and uh, Europe, it's not only between Islam and Europe, but there is between Eastern Europe, Western Europe, that goes back even further than what I described. Uh, different uh, political traditions, which are part and part parcel of deep uh, cultures. So, to negate or try to avoid taking into consideration that there are these fault lines is going to end up, to, be, to put it mildly, with uh, surprises. How can Poland have the government it has now and totally shut off the budget? Well, I mean, it was if you <coughs> polls in Chicago, you would know that that was coming. Thank you.